Well, good. So uh, this panel is something about novels, right? How to write a novel, how to get unstuck how to on your novel. How to start and finish one. The easiest bits. The middle is really. Right. Oh, we lost him. We lost the blue dot. I disappeared, but returned. OK. Um, so let's introduce ourselves. Um, I'm Kyle Gold. I have started and finished a bunch of novels. I've started more than I've finished, but not that many, that many more. Um, so I have been through this a lot, and I have taught some workshops on novel writing and a bunch of panels on novel writing. So hopefully I sort of know what I'm talking about. I'm Ryan Campbell. I've written about 10% of the number of novels that you have. Uh, <laughs> but still, there's some out there. They're legit. They're on bookshelves and things. So that's cool. I've they written uh, cool. Uh, the Fire Bears trilogy. Uh, the third one is supposed to be out this year. And uh, also, um, I have written Co of the Drowned Kingdom and many other um, short stories. And I also edited the um, the Rabbit Dies First anthology. Cool. So when, um... <laughs> all right, we... he's, he's disappeared and returned again. Um... So I was going to ask you, and then I'll also answer it. When you start a novel, how do you how do you go about it? How do you know that your idea is a novel worthy idea, and how do you go about starting it once you've determined that? Uh, for me, it never is a novel worthy idea. It's um, it's just like raw ore that you just kind of have to spend weeks or even months kind of ham mentally hammering into shape before it even becomes um, a novel idea. So I have to think about um, who my principal characters are and what kind of journey I want them to take across the story. I have to think about what in my setting is going to make that story unique and fun. I have to think about what are the big moments, uh, usually big character moments that I'm excited to write. Um, the way that I want to make people feel when they read it. Um, and then just um, some level of some kind of basic outline before I start. Um, usually, <laughs> usually I try to write, I don't know what's wrong with my connection. Um, I don't know if it's me or, or Discord. Um, yeah, maybe. Usually I try to. If you just try uh, audio only for a little while and see if that's more friendly. Yeah, all right. Um, usually I need at least a good third of the novel outlined and some and some idea of what my um, what my major plot points and my climax are going to be like um, before I start writing. So. Um, yeah, for me, Hello? it's <clears throat> hi. You still hearing us? Um, for me, it's more of, I have ideas that occur to me and I write them down and I have like files, but I'm usually working on other projects, so I can't start them right away. So if I keep thinking about a novel idea for however long it takes, sometimes it's only like six months, but in some cases, uh, one of the projects that I was working on earlier this year and then suspended to work on other stuff um, had been on my plate for a good um, probably almost eight years at this point. And it was an idea that I really liked, but um, never had the time to devote to writing it. And then this year I finally said, now I have the time and I still wanted to write it after eight years. So I figured then it would be a, a worthwhile project to spend some time on. Um, like you, I now like to get a lot of it outlined before I start. And I've learned that that doesn't mean that I'm going to follow the outline um, even remotely closely as the novel goes along. But it helps to at least have the signposts up to give me 
a sense of where I'm going and how long it's going to take to get there and what are the steps I'm going to have to use along the, or um, find along the way. So it's there's a certain amount of planning, and I think the the key to me to knowing whether the novel is worth doing is how excited I am by it and how long that excitement is sustained. If it's something where, you know, eight years after having the idea, I still really want to write it, then I probably should be doing that. Yeah, I have stuff that's been itching at me for forever. I do have ideas that I'm like, oh, I want to do that. And then I was like, oh, no, I waited too long. I'm not interested in doing that story anymore. Um, but maybe that's good. Maybe it wouldn't have been great when I actually worked on it. And that's my kind of my uh, instincts letting me know this wouldn't have been a good project for me. Uh, yeah, but there's right. there's some ideas that just that just stick. Um, so I'm going to I'll talk a little about about starting a novel because um, and I'll I'll go first this time and then you can tell me how you start novels. Um, the thing that I, I guess I would address to people who are having trouble figuring out where to start their novel is just start writing it. Start writing it at the first scene that makes you excited about the story. There is a very good chance, at least from my experience, that the first thing you write for your novel will not end up being the beginning of your novel. But you have a lot of time in edits to go over it, and the first rule of your first draft should be get the words down and you can make them better later but if you spend too much time agonizing over your editing while you're trying to get the first draft down um, at least for me that can sap a lot of the pleasure out of finding the story um, for me writing and editing are different modes and it's harder for me to discover how the story is going to move forward if I'm focusing on the word choices and the plot elements and how everything fits together in the current thing. Uh, to that point, I, I was thinking just yesterday, actually, how criticism video really pull, really pull you in opposite directions because criticism is the decision to discard a thought and creativity is the decision to follow one. Um, and it's really, really hard um, if you have a critical brain on, especially in those early moments uh, where you're trying to be creative, um, to, to actually do so because you can't stick with an idea that just needs to be shaped and developed long enough because your critical brain is going, no, that's stupid, that won't work. Um, here's, that, here's this problem with that and here's this problem with that. And so it's just like it's, it's stomping on a little baby like seedling before it has a chance to grow into something. Um, so yeah, I, th I think you really do have to shut that critical side of yourself out, um, which is why free writing helps so much. Uh, I was really stuck at the beginning of Koa 2. I'd rewritten the beginning. I was on my fourth rewrite at the beginning, and I was just like, I need, I need to move forward. I can't rehash this moment over and over and over because the beginning of a the beginning of a novel is so important. You have to give people a sense of the world and a sense of the character and and most of all, like a sense of what kind of story they're going to be into. You should know really on the first few pages of a book whether you know, like what kind of story you're reading. That's that's where mm -hmm. you're getting that contract with the reader. Um, and so it's so important, and that the sense of that important can just crush you because it's so much to think about um so i'd gone through about four iterations of this the beginning of this book and the first time i was like the character i started with a character who was reluctant and i was like that just makes me reluctant so this character should be excited in this scene <laughs> like people were excited about things and things are way more interesting and and they pick you pick up the reader with them so i fixed that and i still kept getting stuck and i was like well I, I you know i've i've spent four nights working on this one paragraph and trying to get through it and the problem isn't the beginning because i know all the things that i want to do the problem is the paragraph so i started free writing and what free writing is is you just tell yourself i'm going to keep writing um and for a certain amount of time and i'm not going to stop for any reason and a lot of times what you'll end up writing is just this is stupid this is stupid this is stupid over and over and over and the point is to bore um 
the critical part of your brain so it shuts off and then the cre creative part of the brain will start going and a lot of what it will put out at first will not be useful but you know if you're on a, if you're on a in a you know 10,000 word segment and five of them are tripping you out sometimes you just need to get over that speed bump and then you can go back and and you can go back and fix it so even if you're writing something really stupid and bad um it can turn on that creative part of your brain so that you start writing good stuff and or so that you start thinking of stuff that you are excited about and what led me into this was uh talking about the critical side i'm sitting here writing a brand new book and I had this idea, and I was like, oh, that would be fun. And like, but I can't do that because it's not in the canon. And I'm like, wait a minute, I'm writing the I can do anything that I want right now. <laughs> if it's a bad idea, I'll just take it out later. So um, um, I think that is really, really important in that early part of the novel to follow bad ideas, um, you know, or, or ideas that look bad at first, because you really don't know. Um, a lot of times an idea just looks bad to us because it's unfamiliar and unfamiliar is what you want. That's where your creativity is acting, but you're like, Oh, I've never seen you before. How are you going to work in the world? And you never know, like you develop it, grow it up from a small child and see what it does. There's a, um, I, I call it the Sherlock Holmes rule because there's a bit in, I think it's the, the final problem where he tells Watson, don't take the first cab that appears or the second cab, take the third. And the reason for that in the story is, well, the first cab is the one sent by your enemies to get you. And the second cab is the one sent by your enemies because they know you won't take the first cab. But the third <laughs> one is the one that you can trust. And I think of that because I think your first idea is often the easiest one yeah. for your story. And it's often the one that like all of your, all of, all of your ideas come from all of the things that you've read, what David Mitchell calls your compost heap, like all the stuff you've read goes in there and then generates ideas. And so the first thing you find is like the easiest thing, but that's also going to be the easiest thing for everyone else. And so then the second thing you find is going to be something that is maybe not as easy for everyone but it's still something that you know people are going to read through and go oh i bet it's not this but they're going to do this but then the third thing you start to dig down into other experiences and other inputs and other things that maybe are more unique to you and that's where you get the people your readers who are going to be guessing and second guessing your plot you're able to give them a little bit of a surprise and that's such an advantage too, because you're first of all, this is this is a problem with outlining first, because when you're outlining, you're not going to think of a lot of the good plot twists or the good uh, um, um, inversions of tropes and that kind of thing, because you're just thinking about it for the first time, um, which is approximately how long your readers have to think about it. But you, whereas they have thirty minutes to think about a situation before they see how it plays out. You have three months, so. <laughs> um, right or more. <laughs> yeah, um, you have to be willing to, you have to be willing to adapt. And if you are an outliner like I am, I think it helps to set up plots so that they can adapt to the new ideas. And interestingly, I think uh, being a a DM for fantasy role playing games has really really helped me with this. Because I have to design plots in which a certain story is going to happen, but can be flexible enough to handle it when the players go off the rails. And that's the same thing that happens when you're writing, right? As soon as you start paying attention to your characters and their reality, um, they're going to do things that you didn't think of, not because you didn't know your characters well enough, but because you weren't looking at the scene closely enough. You weren't in it. You weren't living it with them. And... You're going to you're going to be like, well, I'm going to put the character in this situation and they're going to have no choice but to meh. And then the character's like, why would I meh when I can just as easily, <laughs> much easier do this third thing that you didn't think of that would be right in front of me. And of course, I would think of it when I'm there because of who I am and what the situation is. So you have to you have to build in flexibility into your outlines for for those kind of moments, because if you don't follow them. You'll, you'll be disappointed. And a lot of times, yeah. 
for sure. Same, same with the same with running a game. Like when I run a game, a lot of times because I have experienced players playing for me, I will set up situations and I will think there's no way out of this. There's no way for them to get out of this. They're going to all die. But because I know my players, I know that's not true. And inevitably, they figure out something that I didn't think of. I do the same thing now when I'm plotting novels is I will put my characters in situations where I'm like, there's no way out. Because if I can't see a way out, the reader's probably not going to. But I have a few months to think about a way out by the time that I get there. So um, it's a... Like... The DM model has been very, very positive for me. I think it's. Um, I'm thinking about your your phrase about building flexibility into your outline, <clears throat> and I would say it's maybe important. I don't like. I don't know how you would do that unless it, you would outline loosely, or you don't go scene by scene, or you know you don't take it down to details. But I think what is important is build the flexibility into yourself that you don't have to slavishly follow the outline that two months ago you made in order to get through the novel that you can follow the characters. And this is um, like, there's supposedly a division in the world of novels and stories between plotters and pantsers. And we're both describing generally the world of plotters who, who, write down the story beats ahead of time and then go and write the story to those beats to the outline that they'd set out as opposed to people who just sit down with an idea and start writing and see where it takes them <clears throat> but i think as both of us are saying our methods are really a hybrid of both um, it's important to have the structure of the plot down so that you know where you're heading at each scene but I think for both of us, it's also important to have to leave yourself a lot of room for discovery and exploration in the execution of that plot. Um, so like in the in the book that I'm writing now, I had gotten to a point where I've sort of I was like, I know that these three things have to happen in some order, and I don't know what order. I kind of want to do it like this, but then there's only two characters, and so I have to figure out how they interact. And then um, as I was lying in bed not sleeping Friday night, I told my brain to think about the problem, and it came up with just a crazy idea that I had not even considered at any point while in the previous four months of working on this novel. And I thought it was brilliant. And I don't, I don't think it's quite brilliant, but I think it's very good and definitely good enough to use in the in the light of day and not um, just lying around in bed. So I think you can you can either go like full plotter or full pantser if those suit your writing style. But you can also hybridize. You don't have to do, you don't have to outline down to the scene detail. You don't have to start with nothing and see what happens. Yeah, the disadvantage for pant with pantsing for me is that it requires so much editing later on. Um, Outlining I, definitely saves me weeks and weeks of editing work. Right, like the outline is basically the, the is basically the skeleton of your story. It's the bones. I don't know if you've ever made a living creature before, but it's really really hard to stick the bones in afterward. Yes. <laughs> um, Perfect right. analogy. Yes. Um, let's see. I'm seeing where we are with timing. So let's talk about the middles of novels. Oh, that wasn't in the summary. I didn't study. <laughs> the middles of the... as the most fun part. <laughs> they are the worst. They are the doldrums. <laughs> because, well, I don't know if you're like me. About two months into an idea. It no longer seems fresh and interesting and fun. It's stupid and try and trite and played out because you've spent two months playing it out. Um, and you just lose all faith in it. And this happens to the highest level of professional writers. I have seen everyone from beginners to 
international bestsellers complain about this, that they get about 30,000 pages, 30,000 words in, and they lose all faith in the novel. And I think, I, I think a lot about, um, um, this movie with, uh, Fred, what was it? Nicholas Cage, where he's working in a hospital as an EMT. Um, Scorsese, I got to look it up. I'm sorry. But anyway, so I, I'll just interject while you're doing that, that, um, one one year when Alan Dean Foster was a guest at Rainforest, I was lucky enough to be on a panel with him, and I we were talking about right the habits of a successful writers or something, and I mentioned that that you have to be stubborn enough to push through your novel through the point where you say this is horrible and no one will want to read it, and he said every every writer I know has had that feeling with every novel that they've worked on. Um, he did say, except Isaac Asimov, which is very funny to me. <laughs> yeah, Sorry, I can't I give you enough time to look it up. You did, but I but I failed. And oh, it's called Bringing Out the Dead. Um, anyway, it's it's, it's really interesting. Oh, okay. He um is is a movie about an EMT working in a hospital. Um, it has concepts that help me that have helped me with deal with depression, but also with writing. Like, um, it's the principle of keeping a body alive. Like sometimes people don't want to go on or there's something inside them that doesn't want to go on or there's there's something that's crippling their their biological systems so that they'll fail um and he says sometimes you just have to keep the body going until the heart and mind catch up um Mm. i think about that whenever because i have you know depression and when i'm in the spells basically um, that is something that I think about. You keep the body go. The heart and mind aren't here right now, but I keep the body going. They'll get there. I feel that way about uh, about novels too. When I'm in, when I'm in that middle syndrome, like you just keep writing it. Like have faith in the process. It's going to work, and you know inevitably it does. I've never ever stopped a novel that far in. Um, I've always felt that I wanted to. I've always pushed through, and it's always worked. Yeah, I. I inevitably have sections of the middle of novels where I say, "Oh my God, this is horrible. It's fine. I'll work. I'll I'll cut most of this later. I'll do. It. I'll deal with it in edits." And then after I set the novel aside and come back to it in edits, um, nearly every I would say every time it's not as bad as I thought. A lot of sometimes I still have to cut parts of it, but a lot of times yeah. it's more like. Oh, when I'm just reading this as a story and not sitting staring at it day after day after day, trying to add just two more paragraphs, it feels a lot better. <laughs> I think uh, the other thing that happens is when you're writing a novel, like you're doing some. Every novel is difficult. Every novel is its own challenge. I mean, not for everyone. Some some writers are content to just like, oh, I know I can do this. Let me bang out another one um, this month. <laughs> um, but uh, but I think. M- most writers are always trying something that challenges them with each book, with each new book that they write. And what happens is when you're trying different things, you're trying new things is in the middle of writing a novel, you suddenly go up a level. <laughs> and so you look at everything that you've done so far and you're just like, Oh no, this isn't the best I can do. And it can get easy. <laughs> it can get easy to get trapped in that loop because you really, you really can't go back and redo the stuff you did before at the new level that you went up. The level nine work cannot be re-edited into level 10 work. You just have to accept that, that that's what it is. Like, I'll clean it up so it looks pretty, so no one notices this this bit here that I can't fix because it's just, at its core, at it, its essence, there's a problem, and that's just how it is. Um, you move forward, and you're like, well, I won't do this on the next one for sure. Yep. Um... That said, the those are all very generic, like keep on going um, motivational speeches yeah. to help with the middle. Um, there are things you can do. So like the problem with the middle is when you think of your novel, you think about the beginning and the beginning is exciting. The beginning is a new situation, a new problem, characters setting out heroically. It's, you know, the hobbits leaving the Shire for the first time. It's, you know... Um, 
but uh, and then the ending is also very exciting of your novel. The ending is when everything comes together. It's the climactic final battle. It's the hero realizing their destiny. It's the character making the leap. Um, it's and then everything burning down because that's what I do at the end. They just burn. Yeah, it all everything. Down. I'm not everything using these sets burn. again. Um, and then the middle is where you're like. You're standing there going, well, it doesn't, they can't get to the ending now because they haven't earned it, but I don't know what else to do with them at this point. And so there are uh, a bunch of things that you can do to give yourself ideas to move along in the middle of a novel. Um, you can uh, use subplots which are kind of like side quests for your novel to continue uh, Ryan's GM analogy. Um, you can, you can introduce a new side character or a new side enemy. Uh, you can have a reversal an enemy becomes a friend or a friend becomes an enemy. Um, introduce a complication. And the way to do that is and you should be doing this anyway, at least for the first two thirds of your novel, is to say, what's the worst thing that could happen to my characters right now? Um, so if, you, if you're if you stuck in the middle of your novel and you're like, this is boring, then think about, well, what if a, what if, you know, a new person shows up with extra information? Or what if, you know, the best friend of the hero suddenly has to go off and do this other thing um, or if you have you know, a villain, that's where your villain wins a bit, right? Like, what if, what if this thing that the hero thinks is going to work doesn't work? Um, and remember the the rule of coincidences is that in general, it's it's much more uh, acceptable to use coincidences to get your heroes into trouble than to get them out of trouble. Yeah, that's always fun. I mean, the middle of the novel is where you beat up your characters. That's what you do. Um, you you try to s sprinkle the fear beats with some hope beats, but that's generally where complications increase, um, where they think they know how to solve the problem and they try it and it doesn't work. Um, I tend to try to plan those out a little bit. Um, uh, beforehand just so that I because because I don't want to pad a novel that doesn't feel right like I don't want just like oh this book is too short I guess I'll give people some garbage in the middle to keep reading until they get to the end like it's, <laughs> there's a, there's always there's always character growth that people need to accomplish before they can before they before they can solve the problem uh, of the novel in some way um, there's there's relationships that need to, to develop. That's that's a really important one. I've heard it said. I don't. I can't. I apologize. I don't remember who to credit for, credit for. But every every great story is a story about a relationship. And I think about that now um, w with every. Oh, that's, um, that's Kazuo Ishiguro in his Nobel acceptance speech. Oh, okay, great, great. Thank you. Um, so I, I think about that now. Like, what is what is the principal relationship in the story? And after I heard that, I started looking at looking at it and looking at every great story and it's absolutely true like there's always a relationship that you hang on sometimes it's the relationship um between uh your protagonist and the antagonist sometimes it's the relationship between a, a protagonist and, and, a, and a friend or, or a lover or, or something like that or even even you know um a protagonist and, and their god like that that cut like it's always a relationship between something or it's, a protagonist and their a dead relative or dead like someone, <laughs> someone in the past and the or or nature or their society it's 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 a twist on the it's the twist on the conflict model right like where there's like there are only four basic conflicts and it's like conflict is just one kind of a relationship i would say like take that and there are four basic relationships that make up um make up a story so uh, man relationship of man versus man and man it doesn't have to be versus um stories can be more complex than that right um yeah and and all of the things that we're talking about like subplots and reversals and new characters and whatnot 
should be in service to the character arc. Like if you have a if your if your character's lesson is, um, they I'm I'm going to go back to Zootopia. They need to learn about prejudice. They need to learn that they have prejudice. Then a subplot would be something that exposes prejudice in a way that they haven't encountered before, or could be that. Um, it wouldn't just be a random side quest that doesn't have anything to do with their character growth because then that doesn't advance your story. Right. Um, the same with side characters. The side character should exist in some way in service to the story, although be careful about that. A side character should not exist in service to the protagonist and the protagonist's aims. That's that's not the right. same thing. Um, you should always You should always be able to... Um, look at one of your side characters and think, okay, if they were a protagonist, this would all still make sense as part of their story. Um, right. I've never, I've never been in a situation where I've been in a room with someone and I've thought this person is the main character. I better help them achieve their aims <laughs> ever. <laughs> um, So yeah, <laughs> I'm trying to think of something else to say to that, but it was it was it was good, and I can't follow it up. Um, so middle middles are tough. Um, I, I was gonna say let's let's talk about finishing novels, and then uh, do we have someone who's in the um, the Twitch channel to relay questions to us? I don't think either of us is watching it. Um. I've never so, been to Twitch in my life. <laughs> uh, if we if we don't, then I can try to load it up. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll try and find it. Um, talk about talk about finishes while I try to look up the uh, Twitch channel here. Oh, right. here it's here it is. It's very easy. It's right there. <laughs> um, so finishing a novel is this is. This is, you know, you, you've built up all of your story to this point, and it's got to pay off all the tension that you've created. It's got to um, bring your characters to a satisfying conclusion. And it also has to end your plot in a satisfying way, uh, which is a lot to do. And it's tempting like the really good the really good endings to novels do all of that organically and kind of at the same time as opposed to um you know now here's the the character reaches their goal and now we're going to conclude the plot over here and now like these or or we just like finish the plot but forget about the characters um i have read i have read novels that did that that basically um, finished the the plot and then just stopped and left the characters hanging. Um, so what you what you want when you set out to write a novel is you're trying in general, you're trying to say something. You're trying to say, my character is going through this experience. And it's going to teach them this lesson. And I want to show all of you the lesson that my character learns in the hopes that either you'll learn the same lesson or seeing him learn a lesson will be instructive or something. Um, so the character arc, I think, for me, is the most important part of the conclusion. And you want to make sure that the character's decision at the end of the book is earned, that they change or learn their lesson or fail to learn their lesson based on the experiences that they've had throughout the book so that when the reader gets to that point, they, they feel like that was right, that feels right, and it's so satisfying to have this it's so satisfying to have this happen now. Yeah, uh, it's important to give, especially, especially you know, the longer the story is too. Uh, it's important to give it room to breathe at the end. 
Um, I had, think I had difficulty with with endings of books at first, um, but um, with God of Fire, because it had been such a long series, I ended up having endings staged, endings for each character staged staged throughout, or each group of characters staged throughout. Um, so there's always so that it doesn't all just cram up at the end, um, and, and um, there's there's time for characters to settle into a new normal. I think that's important to establish, right? Um, yeah, I think and, there and, definitely and, has to be like decompression time at the end to give you the sense of a world that's going to carry on. Right. Unless you're and, writing this in a series, in which case you want to like leave room for that. Yeah, it's um, and every ending is a new beginning. Blah 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 blah. Um, but I mean that really is true. Like you don't feel that a conflict concluded unless it's established a new situation going forward, and you need <clears throat> to give people time and 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 space. You need to give the page space to establish something about what that new normal is going to be. Um, not always. Um, some great great stories and great books end on ambivalence but in those cases i would say um even that ambivalence itself is a new normal um that's what makes it okay um we don't know what kind of world is going to come next but not the one we just had and that's that's <laughs> what we were trying to you know that that's what we were trying to trying to fix is get rid of the world that we had and have a new one going forward um those can be really effective because they let readers imaginations um um move forward but f for longer books where where you've really established characters for a long time trying to trying to work towards something i think it's generally unsatisfying to give them exactly what they were working toward that feels usually too pat and mm -hmm. too easy um but you should and 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 that gives you a time for surprise and also time to show character growth because when they react to the new world that's coming to the change situation that you've created at the end of the book it shows how they've grown um so that's that can be a really really valuable character growth moment too even even past the climax yeah there's a whole like there's a whole character arc discussion that we could have about the difference between what a character wants and what a character needs um and the, I mean, the the short version is that the want is the thing that drives the plot through the book, and the need is the thing that drives the character arc. The want is a tangible thing, like I want to finish first in the marathon, and the need is a character trait, or is more related to the lesson you want them to learn, which might be something like stop putting so much emphasis on coming in first that's not what really matters right. um and so i think in in many novels not not all certainly but in many novels the want actually changes several times over the course of the novel and usually what happens is that that happens like around the midpoint so you'll have the character saying like oh i want this i want this and then they try to get it a couple times and it doesn't work. And then the world shows them like, oh, you can't have that. But what you really want is this. Um, and so they're, they're, the want kind of changes as you drive the reader through the story. Um, but the need doesn't change. And that's the thing that you want to address at the end of it. So that whatever happens with the want, whatever the want has ended up being. And... Like maybe they get a thing that they didn't want at the beginning, but they do want now. Or maybe they don't get the thing that they wanted, but they learned the lesson anyway. It has to reflect on the character. Mm -hmm. It has to be like they get the thing they want because they made the change that they needed. Something like that. Yeah. Um, want and want and need are, are often opposed in interesting ways, which makes for fun stories and makes it really easy to make to write the or not really easy, but easier to write that middle of the story because if your protagonist is um opposing what is is pursuing what they want and that's opposed to what they need um 
you can build in a lot of complications that way. The difference between a comedy and a tragedy is just whether the is just that final decision that a character makes at the end, whether they continue um, to pursue a destructive path path in that final choice, or whether that they realize what they need to do and uh, in I not comedy and tragedy, but like happy story and right. tragedy yeah right. or wh or whether they they make the right choice at the end um you can pretty much write them the same up to that moment and and change and make the story pivot on that on that final choice right although as you said there should be clues as to what kind of story you're in for yes yes um so we're we're down to about 15 minutes left, 17 minutes left. Uh, so if there are questions, this would be a good time to take questions um, from the chat. If not, we can find more things to talk about. Um, but we do. Uh, we do. We do have um, we do have a few chat questions in the chat there. Um, Skunk Bomb wants to know, do you have tips about balancing POV in a novel between two or more characters? Hmm. Um, Yes. Um, that gets tricky because you want each of the characters to have their own arc and their own story. And so the... And they stories, have to connect. Right. And so the stories connect have to connect. Uh, what I was going to say is they go at... Each of the stories is going to go at its own pace. And you have to figure out the way to weave them together so that you don't have like... Character one, character two, character one, character one, character one, character one, and then character two, 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 like that. Um, and sometimes, usually, whenever I do it, usually I have to jump around in time a little bit. But also, I like to use um, dramatic irony, where I tell the reader something from the point of view of one character, so that when they go into the scene with the other character, they already know the end of the scene from the other character's perspective, and so they know things that the character doesn't. So I jump back in time. A little bit um but in general i think balancing goes you do it you do it by feel as so you just so write it like we said just write it as you write it and then um as you're editing you will feel whether one character has more weight than another and then you'll have to challenge your brain to come up with a, a thing for the other character to do in that space to make it um, balance better. There are two ways to do that, do that, um, to write multiple POV, two different situations in which you're writing multiple POV characters, I think. And one is when you are writing characters that are participating in the same, uh, same scene or the same action and, um, the other is when they're participating in scenes that have separate se separated action. Um, so um, <clears throat> those those are really really different. If you're writing two characters, like in in the Fire Bears, uh, Clay and Dodo, um, they both get point of view, but pretty much any scene that involves the one involves the other, with minor exceptions. Um, <clears throat> if you go to the the second book, we have Clay and Dodo doing their own thing, but we also have Cloud who's in a completely separate part of the story where all her actions are still important and connected. Um, but there's, there's no other pr um, point of view character there to, to corroborate or to reflect on, on what she's doing or for her to directly interact with. And, and you end up writing those kinds of scenes very differently. Um, having two characters that are participating in the same action is really fun um, because you can expose their blind spots in really, really interesting ways. And and you should absolutely be doing this. Um, mm -hmm. how, how two characters reflect on and see what happened in the previous scene, but di in different ways. Um, they notice different things. Um, they have, they miss different things because they're different people. Or one person thinks, hey, that was really cool. And one another person thinks that was really stupid. One person thinks, oh, I really like this side character. And the other one thinks I really hated that person. Um, those are, those are, great rich ways to do uh to develop character and also to um unbalance readers a little bit with the plot because um 
you're 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 showing different side when you're showing different sides to the action um that shows you shows that reader different possible directions that that action could go um so that's really interesting it's harder when you have i think when you have um point of view characters that are not involved in the same action so i have these two characters um participating in this this one plot thread or on this in this part of the city and this other completely separate character doing this unrelated thing in this other well related but not obviously or immediately related in this other part of the city that is tricky to balance i don't know that i've solved it um in god of fire i have three main uh point of view characters and they're all kind of different areas they all definitely need to do what they're doing and it needs to connect at the end um, but it can be really really difficult uh to balance those hope and fear beats so that you don't end up like yay this is the moment where everyone wins all at the same time and boo this is the moment where everyone suffers a setback all at the same time <laughs> it just the the more you do that the more complicated it is and and I, you know, I, that's, that's, that's honestly not a problem that I've solved yet. It's hard. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, it's, it's hard, but it's also fun. Um, I find it. Oh, agreed. I, I find it really, I mean, I, I, I love playing around with characters, so I, I find it really rewarding <clears throat> to have multiple POV um, novels, uh, which, as I'm thinking about it, oh yeah, I am working on one right now. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, uh, we have. Um, let's see. Uh, Yolfen Coyote says, "Very curious to know about the resolution to the Collation series." I feel like there's a the answer to that is, well, you'll have to purchase the book and read it because we're not <laughs> going to tell you. We're not going to tell you what it is. It's it's. It's coming out January uh, 21st, I think, um, but January of 2021. Um, and it is, uh, uh, it's, it's done. It's been, um, we're, we're trying to get some advanced reviews for it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, the cover's done, the art's done. Um, we're just, waiting on the publishing but it is not it is it it bears only a small resemblance to what i had envisioned for it when i started writing the series um all right um Liko uh, Leko Lim says, uh, I'm, I'm, it's not exactly a question, but I'm focused too much on plot arc and not enough on, on character arc. Um, to that, I would say, I think that you, it, revisit, like, think about what, go back to your story, think about what your character arc over the whole story should be. The plot arc should always be in service to that. There's this kind of, um, um, misconception that there's such a thing as a plot focused story and a character focused story and i don't think those are diametrically opposed i think um, plot are the blocks that you move to force characters to behave realistically within their particular set of motivations and and tendencies so um a plot will and a, a plot arc and a character arc will always have similar structure um it's but it's it's the way that people respond to events, uh, the way that they resist growing, and the way that they eventually grow um, or fail to, if that's your story. Um, that is really interesting, and 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 how that affects the relationships in the story um, as well. So I would say, if you think you're focused too much on the plot arc, um, I would say you've done the first half. You've you've set you've you've set up some some beats in the story, some events that you want to happen, but what's going to resonate with people and what's going to keep them reading is not what happens, but how people react to it, how they respond, what choices do they make? How do the events uh, of the story change how they make choices? 
what what change do those characters undergo and the the events in your plot how do they move people toward or away from that change um i can, i think that's a really really helpful thing to think about uh when you're thinking when you're plotting out your story and thinking about how it'll go yeah the um the when people talk about plot focused stories usually they're talking about things like mysteries or heist movie or heist stories or capers um sometimes maybe space opera also like big um moving parts things but the the mysteries and heist stories that become really successful <clears throat> the ones that kind of break out of the the genre as it were are the ones that include good character as well yes and i think um ryan may disagree with me on this but i think that it's instructive to look at the two of the film versions of murder on the orient express where the the original one with uh is it albert finney playing Poirot? It was, yes. Um, is focused much more on the puzzle of the mystery. It's focused on, here are a bunch of moving parts and clues, and can you figure out from all of the clues how the thing happened? And then the character stories, to the extent that they are there, are, are all in the, the why. They're all in the motive and discovering the motive behind all of it. But it is it is kind of at its heart very much a puzzle story. Um, the newer adaptation with Kenneth Branagh playing Poirot is much less of a puzzle story and focuses more on the character of Poirot and a change that he undergoes as a result of the mystery. And so they do things in that one, like if you're familiar with the book and familiar with the mystery, there are a handful of clues that have particular meaning. And so they will drop them in so that people familiar with the story will recognize them, but they don't spend a lot of time dwelling on them. They don't do the whole scene where like, oh, but this you know, monogrammed handkerchief says this, so what does that mean? They kind of reveal at the end how it all fits together, but it's much, that story is much more about um, Poirot as a man starting out being very convinced that there is a clear line between right and wrong. And by the end of the movie, coming to the understanding that perhaps that line is not as clear as he'd thought it was. Um, which I think is really interesting. And I, I liked the new adaptation, um, even though it was less faithful to the puzzle part of the mystery. but. I thought it was an interesting way to uh, imagine that story. I think there are two kinds of character stories. Um, one is a story that changes who a person is, and one is a story that reveals who a person is. I think Agatha Christie tended to write Poirot uh, stories as stories that revealed who Poirot was but didn't change him, uh, whereas um, um, that movie, I, I agree, did show a change in him. I think that's an interesting, interesting way to tell that story. Um, and I don't disagree with you. It, that was that was a, a story focused on a, one character's journey, um, and it was just a it was a, a different way to it was a different way to tell those kind of stories. I didn't think it was inferior. Um, it was just a different a different take on it, I guess. Yeah, I was I was surprised that I liked it as much as I did, given how casual it was with the puzzle aspect of the mystery. Um, yeah, if you're less familiar with the story, I think it's a little harder to follow. I think that I think that the earlier I like them both. I like them both quite a bit. So you know. Yeah, I think I would I would just add I think Agatha Christie's mysteries in general revealed who other characters were, and Poirot was more the instrument of that revelation than the subject of a revelation. Like I, I'm. I'm less, I, I like her Miss Marple stories better than the Poirot stories, um, I know. But, um, but I think in general, the detective in a mystery 
is the catalyst that reveals whatever character um, study is going on rather than the subject of it himself, especially in a case where um, there's a whole series of mysteries because the detective can't, you can't do that reveal or change every single time. We have two questions left and it's about two minutes. Uh, do you All think right. we can get them? Let's, All right. Yeah, so let's, let's try it. Let's try and tackle each one with a minute for each. Um, so in 30 seconds with dramatic irony, how do you keep the audience from simply waiting for characters to catch up? Um, the point is not the, I mean, the point of dramatic irony is not necessarily when the characters catch up. It is, it is that the audience knows a thing that the character doesn't. So the characters do eventually catch up, but the tension that's created something that the character doesn't is an enjoyable kind of tension to create. Yeah, and for, I think for me, it's kind of necessary. Um, you always want the audience to know a little bit more than the characters do, because that way, when they're when they're making when they're making mistakes, you know the stakes. You're rooting for them not to. You're rooting for them to grow. And I think it's it's um, it's a really helpful tool to make audiences, um, your your readers, um, uh, connect with and 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 want to follow the action because. Better, better than the people who are involved in an action, uh, they know what's involved with whether they, you know, whether they make a right choice or a wrong one in a particular situation. I think, I think it, it hooks people more, not tires them out if you do it right. Right. Um, second question: Do all chapters need to start with a strong hook, and is there a trick to wrapping up each chapter? Uh, you go first. <laughs> All right. On this one, I would say um, treat a chapter as the end of a chapter like the end of a book. The end of a chapter is introducing a new normal for the character in the next chapter. You should want to read to find out what that new normal is. So you give people enough to go like, hey, when you start up with this with this next section with this person, something is going to be different. How is it going to be different? I guess you'll have to read to find out. Um, and then the the start of the next chapter assuming that it's not immediately going into it. if it's immediately going into it just continue like tell people what's different or 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 start start to have them explore that difference um if you have a break between the chapters then i think it's helpful to remind people oh i established a new normal um at the end of the last chapter remember that remember how now this thing is going to be different going forward um let's get into that yeah, I don't think that a chapter necessarily has to start that way, um, but it's certainly helpful to treat the beginning of each chapter as though you have to hook the reader all over again, and the end of each chapter as if you have to give them some kind of satisfying conclusion. Um, and for that matter, it's also the same for each scene within the chapter. You should always start a scene with the... Um, with the intention of making the reader want to finish the scene and end a scene with the reader feeling like something happened, something of import happened. It was definitely worth reading that scene to, to have had that experience. Um, so I think uh, like the, one of the most famous chapter endings in uh in literature is in Hound of the Baskervilles when a um, they, in the in the very beginning the person has come to Holmes and Watson with the story that someone has been killed on the moor and there were footprints going to and from the body and they say well could you identify the footprints and he says Mr. Holmes they were the footprints of a giant hound and that's the end of a chapter um, and someone writing about it said I believe that the title of the next chapter is possibly the least read chapter title in uh, in English literature. Um, so it's 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 fine to do cliffhangers to the next chapter, um, like suspenseful breaks like that. But um, but yeah, so yeah, cliffhangers are not necessarily needed. Just what what is needed, what is the thing you need that what is the thing you you need to read the next chapter to get it's not necessarily right. cliffhanger it's like an action it's an answer or it's um it's a it's the um follow up the explanation of a surprise um that they won't get until they go to the next chapter right 
All right, we are over time. Um, I think that's, that's all the questions. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, uh, yeah. thanks. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, those of you who did. Um, thanks, I'm Ryan everyone. Gamble. Uh, yeah, Ryan, plug your stuff. Where can people yeah. find it? I can find you can find the Fire Bears books. The first one is God of Clay through SoFWolf.com. Um, you can find Smile and the Hero or Co of the Drowned Kingdom. Um, I'm working on the second book, Co of the Doomed Kingdom, right now. Um, for fur and that's at FurPlanet.com, and everything's available on Amazon. Um, and also, I just want to say that I have read a draft of God of Fire, and it's great. You guys should definitely get it when it comes out. Um, you can find all of my stuff on furplanet.com and sofwolf.com, and all my ebooks are on baddogbooks.com. Uh, you can find a bunch of my audiobooks on Audible and iTunes. Just search on my name, Kyle Gold. Uh, you can find me on Twitter, at Kyle Gold. And if you want to be kept up to date, once a month on things that I'm working on and writing tips and excerpts of things and so on, you can join my mailing list at bit.ly slash Kyle Mail, M-A-I-L. Um, it's also linked on my webpage and on my Twitter bio. Um, but yeah, all of my books are out on any site where you would go to buy books pretty much. Um, and that's it. I think we're done. And uh, Yolf and Coyote, I'm sorry that we, I'm very sorry that we missed your other question. Um, you can reach out to me on Twitter at, at uh, the. Is Pendrake. it a quick question? I don't think there's anybody waiting to do another panel. There's no one made it waiting. Yeah, I don't see like. Um, if Let's it's quick, see. we can do a quick question and answer. Have you ever? Uh, this might be. Oh yeah. Have you ever read or written a story where you were more into the story of a? Wait, no, that that you wanted their story. We talked about that one. I don't see the other one. I'm sorry. I don't see the other the other question that you had. So if you could reach out to us on Twitter, um, or in Telegram, um, we'd be happy to talk to you. Yep. Thanks so much. All right. Thanks everyone.